Welcome to the Almost Forgotten Podcast. This is a Black American History Lecture Series, and we're going to get started right now. And I'm your host, uh, Professor Daryl Brackeen Jr. It is my privilege and honor to present to you a Black History Lecture um, from my perspective uh, as the author of the almost forgotten, uh, the first black American congressman uh, to be elected in the United States Congress during the reconstruction era. And uh, that book can be found and available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble online. Uh, So for today's conversation, Uh, we're going to begin a conversation concerning uh, Black American history. And I wanted to, first of all, welcome you to Brackeen TV. Uh, Brackeen TV is the platform for my family's channel, uh, but we have multiple channels. So uh, the channel that you're particularly looking at is uh, the Brackeen Institute, Brackeen University, where I provide educational information on things that I care about and I believe are relevant to what's happening in American society and the world at large. Uh, so uh, so for uh, this series, we're gonna be focusing on uh, Black American history, uh, although uh, it will touch upon some international uh, implications that have happened over time, and we will need to discuss uh, those varying uh, pieces of, of information and how it's relevant uh, to American society at large. Uh, again, I'm an av- adjunct professor of sociology, history, politics, and religion. And you can continue to follow us on all social media platforms on Brackeen TV. Uh, if you'd like to email us, uh, would like to come in and do a lecture or a uh, conversation, masterclass, uh, in particular, uh, any uh, speaking uh, that you would like to be done as a um, commencement speaker or lecturer or even a preacher, uh, you can email us at management at djbjmotivationalmedia.com. Uh, and uh, you can catch us uh, through our various social media platforms. So um, we're just going to jump right in to our conversation. Um, a little bit about um, my background. Uh, first and foremost, I am a husband to a wonderful wife, uh, Chaz Brackeen, who is uh, a social worker and a professor of social work and psychology. And I have three beautiful daughters and I'm a New Haven native, uh, born and raised, although a uh, majority of my family uh, has roots uh, in the uh, Southern part of the United States, in particular, uh, the state of Georgia and Florida, uh, mostly Georgia. Uh, for the most part. So um, as we go through this, we're actually kind of weaving through my personal family history, of which I was inspired by my dad, uh, Daryl Brackeen Sr., who unfortunately uh, passed away um, uh, a few years ago. But he was the one that inspired me into creating our family tree and to really looking at our family history. And based on that, um, I've basically been hooked. Um, um, and I'll get into that story a little later. Um, and in terms of my uh, academic credentials, I'm sure one is wondering how could uh, um, I be able to sit here without uh, highlighting that, right? So um, attended Fairfield University, uh, received my bachelor's in arts uh, as a double major in politics and history. Um, uh, then I went on to Fordham University and received my master's in religious education with a concentration on youth and young adult ministry, but I had a focus area on the Black American ministry and the church and practical theology. Uh, I do have a certificate from the Yale Youth Ministry Institute at Yale University, and I'm currently in progress at Southern Connecticut State University uh, with my business uh, administration's master's, and I'll be receiving that in the next a few months, um, two, three months, and having a concentration in management. 
Uh, so that's a little bit about me and my background. I've also already mentioned, I am the author of The Almost Forgotten, America's Black American Congressman. Uh, these are the first uh, Black American congressmen during the Reconstruction era, which is right after uh, the Civil War in the United States. Um, and you can find this available on Amazon.com and Barnes and Noble. Um, and uh, before we get into our lecture, I just want to lay some ground rules. All right, so uh, this is not a formal, stuffy lecture. All right, I'm gonna totally uh, just let you know that. Um, Essentially, this is a conversation, an ongoing conversation, and the hope is that you send feedback uh, through the various ways of contacting me. I uh, also expect that and suspect there will be questions. Um, I am not the know-it-all, but I do know a lot, right? So I'm going to present as much as I can, and if there's some things that you feel like I miss, uh, feel free to contact me, all right? Uh, so this is an ongoing conversation, and a conversation happens both ways. So I want you to feel like you're learning um, something and also contributing uh, to what will be here on the internet for a very long time. Um, and like I said, um, my uh, interest stems from my family roots. So in case you're wondering about the artwork in the background, I have a seven-year-old, a six-year-old, and a, a, a eight month year old uh, uh, during this time. Uh, and uh, that's some of their artwork. So it's featured right over my shoulder. Uh, I guess I can put that out for purchase. <laughs> I doubt it. Nope, we're gonna keep that. It's priceless. No, you can't have it. So, um, and also um, uh, just really, again, uh, if you have any questions or concerns or anything you'd like to add or uh, would like for me to add, because I may have missed it, um, also, right, there's a possibility that I may misspeak because there's a lot of information rolling around in my head and also trying to ensure that I get all the information uh, that I want to uh, get out there. So uh, just really, uh, if I make a minor mistake that you know I didn't mean in any way, shape, or form, I'm going to apologize in advance and hope to correct it uh, the next go round, the next time that uh, we come live to ensure that we are all on the same page, right? This is going to be some information that um, is not always gonna be comfortable, okay? So I'd like to give that disclaimer that this work is not easy and, um, you know, there's going to be some things that we touch upon uh, that may be uncomfortable. So I ask that you uh, take time, find a place to center yourself. Uh, and uh, if you have to take a break, the great thing is this is on YouTube. <laughs> you can stop it, come back to it. Uh, so I want you to uh, make sure that you take care of yourself and ensure that you're centered uh, in uh, yourself in terms of engaging with uh, this history that has often gone unnoticed and untold. And uh, we will begin by addressing our first question. Why does Black history matter? Why does Black history matter? Uh, and simply to put this uh, before we go into uh, the slides there, I have to say uh, that within the context of American society and European society uh, and society at large, because it has absolutely spilled over uh, in many various different forms, there is something that we will address called systematic racism. Uh, we will start there and to try to address and break down systematic racism and the concept of race and what it means and the various definitions. And um, I want you to uh, be able to have a strong understanding on why Black history is even a conversation to be talked about at all. Um, why is it even being highlighted? Um, and why is it reduced and separated from American history at all? I am under the belief and the opinion that uh, we won't need to uh, highlight uh, the separated histories of uh, uh, really groups that have been dominated by systematic racism if it was just simply incorporated in a proper context in consultation 
with the groups that have been underrepresented, <laughs> plain and simple. But until then, we, uh, uh, those that are in this movement, feel uh, that if we continue to highlight Black history and the histories of um, the underprivileged, uh, the disenfranchised, uh, the subordinate uh, groups within the, uh, the system of systematic racism, uh, that we are combating the the systematic racism and white supremacy at large, right? Uh, so this is, uh, we are in the tradition, uh, we're not the beginning, we're just in the tradition of fighting uh, systematic racism and white supremacy by actively saying that we are here. Uh, our personhood is here. Uh, we are in existence and we cannot be denied in the overall history of humanity. Uh, look, it must be known as an absolute in every starting place in every historical course that the existence of humanity begins in the river valleys of Tanzania, okay, which is on the continent of Africa, uh, all right, uh, under the colonized names of Tanzania. It wasn't its original form and it wasn't its original name, uh, but after colonization of Africa, the names of different countries have been varied. So I must say, that on the continent of Africa is where the existence of humanity rises from. And we cannot cut out African history in the context of world civilization and world history. Therefore, uh, by uh, highlighting black history, uh, which is what my job is today, um, uh, I am combating and you are engaging in um, really uh, the decolonization of our history and the context that we've been presented all of these years. Uh, and quite frankly, a lot of uh, the information we will be presenting, um, you've not, uh, you may have heard it, but you may not have heard the context and understanding of where it came from. So uh, we are going to uh, walk through and clarify and define first in this introductory video, where we're going so that we can set the stage for uh, the actual history. Now, I have to say this, this is vitally important. Oral history matters. Oral history matters. Uh, there has been uh, the Eurocentric approach that written history uh, is the only history, and that's just simply untrue. Uh, that would write out the, um, the stories of indigenous populations uh, and many uh, civilizations and cultures that were advanced and a part of the advancement of humankind if you discount oral history. So uh, there are going to be, um, while there are some individuals that have not had comprehensive written history, uh, we do know at some point and somewhere in some document uh, that their names have been written. Uh, but it may not have been in a comprehensive way because there is likely an oral tradition behind the story of the individual. So uh, we will be incorporating oral tradition uh, throughout uh, this conversation. And uh, again, if there are uh, individuals that uh, you would like for me to review or go over or that you'd like to hear incorporated in this series, feel free to message me again at any of the platforms, Brackeen TV, or you can message me on at Daryl Brackeen Jr. on any of the social media platforms that exist. So uh, let's begin to set the stage about um, this conversation before uh, we begin uh, uh, really doing a deep dive in the historical context. But first, why does Black history matter? The first thing is about representation and recognition. Look, we have to acknowledge the significant contributions of Black individuals that have been involved throughout history over time. And it offers diverse perspectives which will enrich a comprehensive understanding of humanity overall. It's very, history is very vast and it's broad and there's so many individual perspectives that need to be brought to the table and so that we can have a full or close to full understanding and approach to uh, one's cultural heritage, which is another reason why Black history matters. It preserves and it celebrates uh, the rich cultural heritage of Black communities at large. Uh, and it begins to foster pride within the Black community itself. 
and uh, highlight one's roots. And it is at this point that I have to um, uh, say, look, hey, look, I, I, I do I often speak, I often preach in churches and so on. So sometimes I divert, you have to excuse me, but I have to say black Americans, indigenous populations are the original individuals who have suffered by identity theft. Identity theft in the American context, stripping people of their name, their culture, uh, their background, their family history, uh, every other culture and civilization throughout the planet, they're able to access written records uh, and uh, access their family trees and develop that. Many Black Americans do not have that opportunity. Uh, many have to say that they're, they hit uh, what genealogists call um, the, the wall of the 1860s because Black Americans were not put into census materials unless they were uh, listed as a number or a tick mark in uh, the vestitures and the property uh, tax digest of those that kidnapped and enslaved them, all right? So uh, the Black Americans are the original um, uh, Americans who have suffered from identity theft, okay? So we have to bridge the gap and thank goodness for technology that offers uh, DNA uh, testing to sort of at least uh, provide some geographic location uh, in the general sense of where one's ancestors, if you're a Black American, where one's ancestors may have come from um, uh, on the African continent. And even that varies because of the traditions of tribes and uh, the movement of populations and civilizations over time uh, may have been different uh, during uh, the original, um, you know, spaces in which our ancestors uh, were a part of. So, uh, identity um, and this series is going to bridge the gap for individuals who whose history has been stripped of them. Their identity and their culture has been stripped of them and having to uh, solely place one's history uh, in the in the context of enslavement uh, does not make one feel that great, quite frankly. Uh, it, it is empowering to know that your history does not start in enslavement, but yet it starts in the rich history and the vast history of the origins of humanity at large. Uh, so uh, we find that uh, social justice and equity work and equality work is absolutely vital uh, to illuminating uh, the struggles within uh, racism and the injustices that one faces within the systematic uh, racism that goes on in American and uh, I would venture to say the world um, because the, the vestiges of col uh, colonization has impacted the entire world and uh, white supremacy and uh, how that pervades throughout the general society uh, has been impacted in that way as well. All right, so, uh, and next, um, this impacts the educational enrichment of an individual in order to provide a more complete and accurate historical narrative and to challenge those stereotypes and those misconceptions. Uh, by doing that, we are creating some, a system of empowerment uh, for individuals so that there's uh, inspiration uh, showcasing and highlighting Black role models, Black leadership, and potentially inspiring uh, future generations. Uh, look, uh, Black history isn't just for the inspiration of Black people. Black history is for the inspiration in the broad human context so that it impacts all children, all generations in the future uh, to see a diversity of individuals within the broad context to provide them inspiration in their life. Diversity, and it's been uh, there's been so much research done, and this is not my race and ethnic studies class, in which I have taught and will teach in the future, but um, there's just way too much evidence uh, that shows that one that is exposed to a diversity of humanity are often the most productive in society and often most advanced in terms of the outcomes and the work product uh, towards collaboration and ensuring that uh, the work of um, whatever space and context that individual is in is most productive. So understanding historical context 
offers insights into historical events and the impact on present day black communities. All right, so we must context the social issues that are being faced in our present society with a historical perspective. Man, what an insult it is to live in a society that tells black people to get over the, the hurdle of slavery and to move on. If you ever told that to any uh, uh, other cultural group that had traumatic experiences, you would be canceled. Why is it acceptable for individuals to tell black Americans that they need to stop rehashing old traumatic things uh, and uh, to stop having this conversation and simply move forward? With all due respect, you cannot move forward if you were uh, stripped of your identity. You cannot move forward if you are stripped of your history. And this course is seeking to create the space for us to unapologetically have the discussion and to have the space to learn of the history, regain that identity, and to uh, and also uh, broaden the perspective of each and every individual. So this is not just for Black people. This is for every person on planet Earth. You should be open and feel free to engage with the educational enrichment and the empowerment of understanding the historical context that humanizes your fellow human being. Uh, and uh, we're going to begin to see the different global contributions and that recognizes the impact of Black individuals in various fields, demonstrating that interconnectedness of human engagement uh, that celebrates those achievements and promotes a holistic understanding of excellence in the various domains. That cultural diversity and appreciation enhances cross-cultural understanding and collaboration. Ultimately, this is about building social cohesion to promote a shared understanding of historical experiences. This is about the legacy of our future that honors the legacy and paves the way for progress and encourage that active participation in shaping a more inclusive future. And of course, we're going to address the intersectionality. Uh, being a Black person is not a monolith. There are, are many sectionalities and intersectionalities, and we're going to stand in solidarity in that spirit as we recognize those experiences and uh, foster that type of solidarity across the various marginalized groups. All right, so I'm gonna try my best. While again, this is not a, um, a comprehensive course, this would take me an entire year to comprehensively highlight all of those intersections, but we're gonna do our best to ensure that we um, provide that type of inclusion and challenging um, our understanding of uh, the system that is right now. So uh, now I want you to take a, a quick breath, take a deep breath. We just did our overview. Now we're about to jump into the piece that's most challenging. And again, it would take me an entire year to uh, really comprehensively break down uh, uh, you know, systematic racism and white supremacy and how it has shaped our um, ultimate uh, conversation and why we have to have Black history. Let me also say, I have chosen very purposely not to hold this conversation in Black History Month because I believe Black history is a human history that needs to be talked 365, 52 weeks in a year. So um, uh, you may highlight this uh, series uh, throughout uh, Black History Month, but its intention is to be done 365. And it is our hope that you walk away with that understanding as well, because that history has not changed and it will not uh, change. And it is not uh, to be confounded and compounded within uh, just the month of February. All right. Although um, uh, times have changed and uh, people like to recognize certain things during those moments, which is absolutely great and wonderful. I just want to be clear that if we are a part part of the work of systematically combating uh, racism and white supremacy, uh, uh, the tool of teaching black history 365 days out of the year is absolutely crucial uh, to uh, changing that narrative and utilizing the tools 
that are absolutely necessary uh, towards the subject matter of Black history seeking to combat systematic racism and white supremacy. Uh, black history is essentially the narrative that serves as a powerful tool in combating black and combating systematic racism and dismantling the structures of white supremacy by delving into the historical tro struggles, triumphs, contributions of black individuals, societies gain a profound understanding of the pervasive challenges that black people have faced. This knowledge not only fosters empathy, but it also cultivates a sense of shared humanity, promoting solidarity amongst diverse communities and acknowledging black history becomes a catalyst for societal progress, challenging the ingrained prejudices and inspiring the collective efforts toward a more equitable and inclusive future. It calls for examining the systematic roots of discrimination, all right? And we have to actively participate in building that world where justice and equity prevail, transcending cultural and geographical boundaries. All right. Embracing Black history is an integral step towards fostering a global society that values the dignity and the rights of every individual. All right. Now, systematic racism. Systematic racism is um, a societal structure that creates a complex network of economic, political, social, and cultural structures and actions and beliefs that systematize and perpetuate an unequal distribution of privileges, resources, and power. And in the American context uh, is white, uh, white versus people of color. All right, now this is, this is where it gets a little tense for folks and, um, and people tend to offer and get offended. So I wanted to take this moment to offer some definitions of clarity. There is systematic racism. When people hear racism, they automatically think that we're talking about the color of one's skin. Let me offer you some relief and clarity. Systematic racism does not just talk about the color of someone's skin. Racism is about the social constructs that have been created within this particular society. And for us, in this context, we're talking about American society and a little bit of the European society in which if you look at an application as created constructs, you're either going to have to check off a box of male, female. You have to check off a box uh, concerning a disability. You have to check off a box concerning uh, your ethnicity. Uh, ethnicities that have been created in America is called white. So there is a box for white, uh, although that is not technically an ethnicity. An ethnicity refers to your country of origin, okay? But in America, there is a construct called white, uh, which uh, is a catch-all for individuals who have a certain skin color hue of um, essentially what I'm going to say is really uh, a loss of melanin um, in skin tone, okay? So uh, if you are of European descent, you're likely going to check off the box white. Uh, if you are um, an individual that is a of a brown color hue or uh, going down the hue of uh, skin tone colors, uh, you're going to check off the appropriate boxes based on whatever your origin is. In America, the box black is created for individuals whose origins uh, come from the continent of Africa. Therefore, uh, you check off the box black. Um, you know, there's other constructs that are created on most of those applications concerning Hispanic or Latina or uh, Asian uh, descent or Middle Eastern descent. It goes on and on and on. Uh, these boxes have been created. Now, in America, legally, and we will review some of the laws that um, primarily centers whiteness um, and uh, gave the advantage to individuals who uh, 
or within the white construct. Uh, the, the foundations of American society uh, was on race, plain and simple. The color of one's skin determine your economic outcome, determine uh, what your profession was going to be. If you were an individual that uh, were uh, under the black persuasion, your profession will be enslavement. All right, uh, that, that's the from the foundations of American society. There were some exceptions, uh, but even in those exceptions, uh, within a few years time as uh, society was developing, many of those individuals of African descent that may have had property or so on and so forth, eventually lost it. Generations lost those uh, vestiges of economic prosperity and were either pushed off or uh, sold off or even moved about. Um, and not having the rights um, in certain locations throughout uh, the geographical American context. So I just want to uh, clarify uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about race. Uh, and races, systematic racism, it includes gender, it includes uh, skin color, it includes uh, 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 individuals that have differing abilities, uh, uh, raising the construct of ableism uh, in this conversation is absolutely vital. Of course, gender, all right? The, the rights of women uh, were just as um, in shambles in American society as the rights of uh, many uh, uh, disproportionately disenfranchised groups. As a sociologist, my viewpoint is there are uh, everyone refers to majority and uh, majority and minority. Uh, from my context, you'll hear me use the words uh, dominant and subordinate. Uh, all right, so uh, those within the subordinate groups are the ones that are being trampled on as a result of those within the dominant context, uh, which creates the idea and the construct. There are individuals. Uh, who uh, are much more well-trained than I am, that studied this idea of whiteness. So there are even whiteness studies. Uh, what does this mean? What is this dominant cultural thing? An individual who is within a subordinate group, if you are looking to play the game, the legal game within the American context or wherever it might be, uh, if you're looking to play the game and to offer the advantage, it is in one's advantage to opt into whiteness, uh, whatever that is. And uh, many refer to it as respectability politics. Uh, and, and the list goes on and on. If, if you play the game within the American construct of uh, systematic racism or whatever system uh, you may be purveying in, um, you can opt in, all right, uh, for individuals that may uh, be Black Americans and opt in in uh, to the construct of whiteness, uh, that's called internalized racism, all right? Again, I don't have time to go into too much detail. Maybe another time I can have a race and ethnic studies class that goes much more deeper into these uh, examples, but I don't have much time to do that. The bottom line is there is a separation between an individual who is um, engaging in systematic racism as a result of the society we are in and versus an individual who is a white supremacist, who is an absolute, uh, this is what you will call a racist. This is an individual who believes that uh, whiteness, the idea of whiteness uh, is meant uh, that you have the God-given uh, uh, space to be in the dominant construct of a society and that you, um, just believe whiteness to be white is um, in whatever way uh, a higher uh, space to be in than those within the subordinate groups and of darker skin hue. All right, so I, I wanted to make sure that we understood um, that an individual racist and individual racism is based on one's actions and the belief of individuals that support culturally accepted oppression towards targeted racial groups. And the last thing that I uh, actually don't have listed, but I think it's important, 
is that those that are uh, within systematic racism um, and you have to check off the boxes and the categories based on whatever preconceived notions you may have, that is, um, and you benefit based on the box that you checked off, that's called white privilege, all right? So there's a great majority of individuals who's not racist at all. But uh, because of systematic racism and the way things uh, were established legally, and we'll get into that, um, you are there, right? If you're in modern day con context, you weren't there when the system was created. So I can understand why you would think you're, you know, this is not, this is not something I did. Therefore, this is not my issue. I, I don't disagree with that, except to say uh, that there are some privileges because of the system that was set up. All right. Um, this is going to become crucial when we get across the conversation of, um, which will come up about the idea of reparations. And what does that look like in the Black American historical context? Uh, so since uh, you did not, in modern day terms, create the system, is it the right thing to do to ensure uh, that the system that was created beyond you and your time, uh, is it the right thing to do to ensure that those that have been uh, disproportionately impacted by the past uh, be restored uh, reparations in the present. So that's a conversation that um, will surely be had in the context of this course. All right, very good. So we will transition to uh, get a better understanding concerning slavery. Uh, we will uh, come back in the next episode to define and better understand what um, ancient slavery and that ancient slavery system was about versus uh, the transatlantic version uh, of, of slavery uh, through the use of systematic racism. Uh, what did, uh, we'll touch a little bit on um, uh, the idea of did uh, race based on skin color exist in ancient times, all right? Um, uh, these are things that we'll grapple with in the next episode. I am absolutely thrilled that you have chosen to join me on this voyage through Black history in the context of uh, what is uh, honestly a conversation that needs to be had in every history class uh, throughout America and throughout uh, society as abroad. Uh, again, this is uh, the Almost Forgotten Podcast. This is episode one of the Black American History Lecture Series, and it is my absolute hope that this is something that you can learn about, take home with you, uh, like and share uh, this information. Uh, every time you like and share, you are being a part of the movement to combat systematic racism and tearing down um, the disproportionate uh, effects that have uh, so pervaded our society for way too long. Again, this is the Almost Forgotten Podcast, and I'm your host, Daryl Bracking Jr. Please like and share, follow us at Bracking TV. Have a good one, and come back for episode two. <laughs>